Welcome to this panel on what my social justice means to me. My name is Evangeline Abriel, and I'm the director of the Center for Social Justice and Public Service here at Santa Clara. And we have a wonderful panel of law professors to talk to us about the social work that they do today. I just wanted to give everyone the website address. Before we get started, I wanted to make sure that you had the website address for the um, Center for Social Justice and Public Service. Please take a look at, the, at this website because we have a lot of projects and events and some will be of a special interest to you, including the certificate program for social justice and the summer stipends that can be used in the summer for students who are working for nonprofit organizations. Um, social justice is really at the heart of Santa Clara. It's a fundamental part of Jesuit teaching. And as lawyers, we play such a critical role in ensuring a just world. So, and I know from speaking to many of you that you come to Santa Clara already committed to social justice. So I'm so pleased to be able to present these, this panel of law professors to you today. These professors are not the only ones at Santa Clara that do social justice work. Our staff, the other faculty members, and especially our students provide a great and extensive amount of social justice work. So we're very proud of all of that. In order to save time a little bit, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves rather than my introducing them. So I'll ask us to get started with Professor David Ball. Great, thanks, Vanjie. And you know, I just want to say that we're going to try to keep it brief on the brief side so that you all can um, ask questions. But I also want you know you to know that you should be able to ask questions of all of your professors, including everyone on this panel. Um, you know, part of what we pride ourselves here uh, on at Santa Clara is that we're all a community, and so we are here to support and discuss with you and to you know to make sure that you all feel comfortable talking to us about things so just briefly my my most of my social justice work is all is about uh, the criminal legal system and about sort of reforming it in all of the various ways uh, that it could use reform so i've worked on um you know, I worked on, uh, I worked a lot in prisons. So I've been the corrections committee chair of the American Bar Association for about 10 years. And so we've done things like making sure that uh, people can call their loved ones from prison without uh, paying exorbitant fees. Uh, you know, the cost per minute on a phone call from prison is, is, you know, in some cases as much as a dollar a minute. Um, the same is also true for you know video visitation, which all of you have on many apps in your phone right now for free. Those can be really expensive and in some cases they have replaced in-person vis visitation so folks never get to touch their loved ones or their kids or hug their kids uh, throughout the time that they're in prison, which is you know not good for anyone's psychology but also tends to be bad for recidivism. So those are some of the issues that I work on. Um, I've worked a lot on, you know, pretrial reform, uh, both in Santa Clara County and, you know, consulted with various people uh, across the country on that. And um, just essentially, you know, trying to, uh, now I'm obviously, or as is probably obvious, like I'm concerned about police violence and, and policing practices more generally. So um, those are all of the things that, that I work on. Um, Vanjie, was there another question about why I got involved with it? Is that... Yeah, why well, I got involved with it? Um, because I don't like things that are bad and I want to try to fix them. So I think that that's fundamentally the reason is that, you know, see something, say something, do something. Um, and uh, the good news for all of you is that sometimes I think it can feel overwhelming, but being a lawyer actually does give you some tools uh, to help further the conversation in ways that ordinary or non lawyer citizens. Uh, don't have access to necessarily. So that's part of why I think I, I like teaching law and, and why I think uh, it's important to learn law is that, you know, we can help you channel some of your, your feelings of angst or, or you know, um, feeling that things are wrong. We can help you develop ways of, of actually addressing that. Oh, and by the way, I was the social justice teaching fellow here before I joined the faculty. Uh, but I broke that, so I was the last one who did it. Um, and so uh, I'm the last social justice teaching fellow uh, who was ever here. So but that was a pretty cool job title uh, to have on your business card. I teach social justice. So anyway, that's it for me, Deep. Um, I think Colleen is next. She, she's on. Oh, whoops, sorry. I screwed it up. <laughs> is Colleen, are you on, Professor Chen? 
I don't see her yet, <laughs> Professor Abel. Okay, well then we'll move on to Professor Gillis second. <laughs> All, right. All right, hi everyone. Um, Deep Gillis Akram, for those of you who don't know me, I teach constitutional law and immigration law here. So thinking about the idea of social justice and what it is that I do with social justice, I guess I divide it into two things. And one is uh, as part of my professional competency and what it is that I research and write about and teach is my immigration concerns and the rights of non-citizens and constitutional questions in that arena. And so one of the things that that has allowed me to do is to consult with uh, litigation strategies and um, people in California, groups in California that are introducing legislation at the state and local levels that are intended to protect immigrants. Uh, for example, recently there's been movement in California about reducing or California stepping in to stop detention of, uh, of non-citizens in California. That raises some extremely thorny issues of preemption and federalism intergovernmental immunities, all sorts of boring doctrines uh, that seem abstract and, and not applicable, but in fact have significant application in this area. And so uh, talking to groups about how to, to frame their, uh, their legislation, argue about it, um, are, is some part of what I do with regards to social justice. But a very different part of what I do with social justice actually has nothing to do with um, my professional competencies as a law professor and actually started when I was a, a, a private practice lawyer uh, working at a law firm. And I would, I guess this is partly a, goes to the why of why I do what I do. Um, I went to work for a law firm uh, doing all the things that law firm lawyers do, which is great, helped me pay off law school loans, uh, but it wasn't scratching uh, an itch that I had to do something interesting and good for the world. Um, and so part of what I do with my time outside of being a law professor is I help run a nonprofit with some friends who I met in college who are doctors and we do international medical development, try and create sustainable solutions for target communities so they don't have to rely on foreign assistance and foreign aid uh, when they are rebuilding uh, infrastructure, medical infrastructure and skills training for the future. There's nothing to do with what I do as a, as a law professor, but I will say for those of you who are interested in, in thinking about what it is that you're learning here, it is the skills that I learned in law school and as a lawyer that helped me a lot in that job. I do a lot of negotiating with people. I paper all of our contracts, which I have zero business doing as a real lawyer, but we can do it for this purpose. Um, and also just in terms of the ability to write, you know, it involves a lot of copy, a lot of framing of what we're doing, and that's what I, I'm relied on by my colleagues. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about the specifics of that work, but it's taken me around, you know, across the world and, and meeting some really interesting people. Uh, right now we're in a project in Madagascar with uh, Operation Smile, trying to build up surgical capacity and access to surgical basic surgeries there so that people don't have to die when they get appendectomies or uh, C-sections or they have broken bones. So a uh, little on hiatus because of COVID, but hopefully soon afterwards we'll be pursuing that again. Um, again, happy to talk to people about why I do what I do and where this all comes from. Uh, like, I think maybe I'll end with the story somewhat like David. I was a middle school teacher right after college before I went to law school in, uh, and I was a middle school teacher in New York City. And I remember I was given an eighth grade class and the title of the eighth grade class was social justice. And I asked the principal of the school what I was supposed to do with that class. And he said, I don't know, do social justice. So there you go. Maybe it started from being an eighth grade teacher. idea of the expanse of the work being done by people here at the law school. So thanks so much. And I see Professor Chen is on. Hi. Oh. Yes. I want to make sure I can actually be in the camera because I want to adjust this. Um, but it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for welcoming me. And uh, it's my first year that I was invited. So I feel very, um, very honored. So um, what I'll say is I, I teach in mostly the tech law program. Um, I'm teaching international intellectual property right now and AI, but I'm also um, somebody you know, who got back into it in my legal career through pro bono work um, when a couple years ago, uh, there was a sort of various talks and then invitation to work on the clemency. So you know, the only thing I'll just say and warn you is that once you get pulled in, and maybe you was already pulled in because you're already in this audience, 
it kind of doesn't let, let you go. So I would say, you know, I, I'm an engineer, I you know, worked in a law firm, and then I ended up um, always sort of doing pro bono, sort of public interesty things on the side. But then when I had this opportunity to do it um, professionally, just to work on clemency petitions, um, I was able to kind of get contact with clients. And I think, uh, especially just in my purview, sort of working in tech all the time, I wasn't having that contact. And so once I had that contact with clients and sort of saw some of the issues that I thought, you know, my, my expertise in, in tech law could be useful, I could see a lot of, of areas of overlap. So if any of you are folks who are kind of interested in social justice, but aren't sure you're gonna make it a career, I mean, the great thing about it is by just sort of keeping in touch with people who are doing good things, you're going, to, you're going to see ways of being able to add value. So I think from a career development perspective, again, um, having a pretty different background myself, being in tech and, you know, being an engineer and, and sort of doing that whole set of um, activities, uh, you can bring something different to the table, um, something distinctive. And as long as you're sort of willing to be humble and, and learn from you know, sort of all the people who are doing really amazing work around you, um, you can be part of the, the, you know, part of the solution, right? And, and I think that all the work is, is, is inspired by hopefulness that we can sort of improve um, what we're seeing go on in the world. Um, the other thing I'll say is, in, is I worked in, so and now I do a lot of work in criminal justice, um, mostly working on trying to close, I would say these technical gaps or these expunge, gaps in expungement and second chances. Um, I've worked with a lot of students at the law school. Um, so, but I, you know, the a couple of things I think are really amazing about doing social justice, either as your main, your main job or doing it um, on the side is, you know, there's, there are, um, <clears throat> there are gonna be just a lot of opportunities, again, to do and you know, grow your skills um, in a diverse way. So when I was in the firm, you know, in my first year doing pro bono cases in law school, I did asylum work and I had asylees, uh, you know, successful asylum, I think it was a VAWA um, petition. You just can continue to have a very interesting stream of work. And often it's, you know, it just, it would just encourage you to always find a project to work on, even if you're in practice and that's not your main project, um, knowing that, again, it can become your main project. Um, but I think it's also just, you know, being around really good people. So I worked in the government um, in, uh, in the Obama administration. And again, it was an innovation and intellectual property position, but everybody there was really mission driven and really was interested in trying to, you know, sort of move the ball forward. So just being in contact with people, I continue to work with them very closely, um, uh, you know, sort of all the time. It's just even again, coming back into law and teaching tech law, I continue to be influenced by the people. So I think the people, are great in social justice, they're the best people, and the projects are, and the clients are most interesting. So at whatever level of involvement, engagement, um, you know, you're interested in doing it. And again, I'm, I'm happy to talk to people. I have to go a little earlier today, but I'm happy to talk to folks offline as well about working in the government or sort of doing pro bono work while you're in a firm, because so I have those experiences. Um, but anyway, the best people and the best projects. So I think that's, those are all good reasons to, to continue to stay engaged in social justice. Stay tuned for more information about the Second Chances Hackathon that Professor Chen is organizing. With Vanjie so, and Ellen. And Ellen, yeah. So, and that's a good segue into Professor Kreitzberg. Great. Well, greetings, everybody. And actually, it's, it's great to see my colleagues because I haven't seen them in person. And so even seeing um, my fellow faculty members is wonderful. So, um, a little bit, uh, as I said, about what, what we do and what's interesting and, and, and hopefully inspire a lot of you. So my background is criminal defense work. So like David, in some ways, my area of, of, of social justice work tends to be criminal justice, racial justice, uh, and areas in that venue. Uh, I was 10 years a public defender in Washington, DC. Uh, and my specialty within that is the death penalty since about 1982. I've been working on capital cases around the country, uh, mostly on post-conviction level. And then since coming to Santa Clara, I actually have a program where we train lawyers around the country to um, defend capital cases. We're a Jesuit institution, so we don't train anyone who wants to kill people. We train those who will try to save their lives. Uh, so in, within the death penalty, um, there's a lot of work to do, both in terms of um, uh, Litigate, legislation work. Uh, right now we have a, uh, a governor who's declared a moratorium, but uh, four, four, four or more, more what? what? Uh, four or more four criminal, more criminal, criminal, criminal justice, justice bills 
Oh, I'm getting a funny echo, sorry. Um, pass the legislature in the, in the waning hours. And so there's a lot of lobbying to do with the governor. One involved uh, limiting people who can be executed. One involved a jury selection and not applying it in a racially biased manner. Uh, and that's the one that's actually gonna be a big fight with the governor. One involved uh, just the Racial Justice Act, um, uh, which is a huge issue in terms of him having to review cases from a racially justice perspective. Uh, and finally, there was one involving disciplinary hearings in jail and uh, the, the people in the prison having to get actual evidence before they discipline someone instead of just uh, rumors and innuendo. But this fall, my most important work is probably going to be about the election. And those of you who are interested, there is a lot of get out the vote work, even though it's done remotely, that's gonna be possible. Um, putting together materials for people that uh, that can be everything from write postcards, write letters, make phone calls, uh, volunteer to be a poll watcher on election day because the usual demographic for that is over 80 and a lot of those people aren't coming out. Um, be a poll monitor to make sure there are not uh, problems that take out. And so I will try to put together materials that then students can pick and choose. Um, I'll have Vanjie either send them out or post them on the website or we also have a social justice Facebook page where we post things. So find the Facebook page and and then go to it. I'm, I'm more of a Facebook stalker, but I, I will post things like here access to organizations. And finally, what can you do as a student? Tons. Um, and we will try to make a lot of that available to you through the Center for Social Justice. Vanji mentioned a, a one day hackathon that Colleen started about two years ago where it's wonderful partnership with lawyers, business students, uh, engineers, who find technology solutions to uh, public interest organizations. Um, everything this year is gonna be a little more complicated because it's all remote, but if you bear with us, we're gonna try fi to find ways to adapt it. Uh, I believe the center is gonna again do social justice um, pro bono placement that allows especially first year students to be placed with organizations so you don't actually have to find them even for as little as five hours a week. That happens in the spring. So this fall, you really wanna focus on your studies and focus on getting out the vote work because we gotta leave it all on the table this fall or it's, you know, you have no one to blame but yourself. Um, and finally, there is uh, my last pitch about uh, death penalty work is while in California, we're in a bit of a hiatus that hasn't stopped people from uh, seeking the death penalty and having trials. And for example, in Wyoming, um, conservatives against the death penalty. Uh, it looks like a, a Wyoming may move over to the no column, but there's even remote work that you can do with social media if anyone wants to get involved with that. Um, and my last thing is I'm just gonna give a shout out because I've been partnering with Colleen who is just an incredible social justice warrior and we welcome people in tech and business and transactional work um, because social justice is not just what you do every day, it's part of who you are. And we don't wanna talk everybody out of going to big law, go to big law, make lots of money, but then turn some of it into social justice work. So we'll see you on the social justice platforms and please feel free to reach out to me um, and I'll turn it over to who's ever next in alphabetical order. Okay, thank you so much. And it's Professor Mosquist. Uh, hello everyone. Um, welcome back to school, can't really say campus. Um, it's so good to see um, all of our um, law faculty and colleagues and others back. It's, um, we're in a weird space, but we're all making it work as best we can. Um, again, I'm Deborah Moss West. Um, she, um, Professor Abriel asked us to say a little bit about why we do our, this work and our background. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, I was born and raised in um, the Bay Area, San Francisco to be exact. I went to San Jose um, State and then Santa Clara and graduated in 1994. I didn't always want to be a lawyer. Um, really, I was kind of intimidated about the thought. Um, I didn't even tell anyone I applied and told people when, it, when I was going, oh yeah, I'm getting ready to go to law school in a couple of months, that kind of thing. Um, but I always wanted to be a teacher. My dad wanted me to be a lawyer. He saw a lot of injustice in our community, believed that lawyers had access to resources, um, that could bring about some much needed change. And so I do what many people do. And once I graduated from undergrad, I said I was going to follow his wishes. And that's how I kind of made my way um, to law school. 
um, I guess that's kind of also the basis of the beginnings of my social justice work. Um, just, it was part of what we do, um, who I am. Um, in some ways we call it social justice work, but I don't know if it's work, I don't know what you call it, but um, as was alluded to um, by Ellen and others earlier, I think sometimes it's just like the fabric of who you are. And so you can do that work from so many different, um, I, I say you can do it from any space. Um, so like um, two others, uh, Professor Abriel and Professor Kreitzberg, I was also at the Center for Social Justice and Public Service. That was my first role um, that I had at the law school when I came back. Um, but today I direct the Catherine and George Alexander Community Law Center. It's um, the law school's community-based clinic. It's about two miles from campus. And as you may know, we have a two-fold mission. That's to train law students and then to be um, provide free legal services for low-income people. We train law students to be lifelong social justice advocates. So as we said before, no matter what you're doing, what kind of work you're doing, um, you can do that work through a social justice lens. We have a staff of about eight um, people and along with students and volunteer attorneys, we serve about a thousand people each year. Now my primary role there is administrator. Um, and I say that um, kind of as an aside and I, in some ways I think this connects to um, something Colleen said earlier about um, kind of utilizing your skill set, right? So some people know that working full time in um, public interest and social justice is not the right space for them for whatever reason. And for me, early on, I realized that I love administration. That's where I feel like my skill set is um, stronger. It's what I love to do. And so that's the kind of work that I do. My pastor many years ago said something that really stuck with me. He said, when you're operating in your gift, you have maximum effectiveness with minimal frustration. So I don't know if he was the first one to coin that term, but it stays in the back of my mind in the sense that um, you know when you're doing the work that's right for you. So um, administration is my sweet spot. I also really love teaching. I also really um, like um, direct service, but I know that my sweet spot is administration. So whatever you're doing, if you can, you know, find your sweet spot. What is the role that's right for you? Um, and when you find that role that's right for you, it's interesting how it, the doors can open sometimes for you. So for me, um, I started in legal services not working as an attorney. I started in administration um, as a director of an agency. And that doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen again when you are kind of working in your sweet spot and working towards the, the areas that are, um, that are best for you. So it wasn't so much that I was special. Um, it was like, this is the right kind of role for me. And so I have been like honing that skill set, even in different um, arenas. I'd worked in HR, I'd worked in contracting at a corporation and other things, but those skill sets were just what was needed for the East Bay Community Law Center when they went from a small organization, many people may, may know of them, they are affiliated with Berkeley Law, but they grew from like 10 or 12 people to when I came, there were like 20 people. And then they now they're at about 90. But they needed someone with that administration or administrative skill set that also had a law degree to run that. So anyway, that was kind of an aside, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of kind of um, how I came to this work and how you can have all different kinds of skill sets and use them to um, effectuate um, justice or bring about change. Um, and many of my social justice work actually happens outside of Santa Clara Law. So um, in addition to you know working at the Law Center, um, I was recently um, for about five or six years on the State Bar of California's Access to Justice Commission. I'm also working with the California Lawyers Association and their Diversity Outreach Committee. Our primary focus is um, pipeline to get more um, people of color um, and diverse folks into the legal field. I'm also part of the Santa Clara County Bar Association, um, an agency that I've been quite active in in the last few years is the Charles Houston Bar Association. I'm currently their legal services chair I'm also the co-chair of our kind of newly formed uh, racial justice task force with our current charge is around focusing 
on anti-racism um, efforts, especially as it relates to police brutality. And as Ellen was mentioned, you know, this next, what is it, like 70 days now, 65 days, um, the get out the vote efforts, not only at the presidential level, but also looking at supporting legislation that will advance, um, uh, advance anti-racism efforts. So one, for example, is, um, one proposition we're supporting, for example, is Prop 16, which is looking to reveal Prop 209 or repeal Prop 209 and or restore um, affirmative action. So I could talk for a long time, which I already did. So I'll stop right there um, and look forward to just connecting with all of you. Well, thank you for reminding us all the ways that lawyers can serve. Um, and so thank you. And I'll turn it over now to Professor Rivera. Thank you, Mandy. Well, it's great to see everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Francisco Rivera. I'm, I'm the founding director of the International Human Rights Clinic here at Santa Clara, and I also run our Costa Rica and Geneva Summer Abroad programs. So if you have any questions about those, you can ask me as well. Um, so I view social justice, or, or more broadly speaking, human rights work, as really my life's calling. It really is. Um, when I went to college uh, in 1994, I read a book called The Massacres at El Mozote. And it, the book described, it was written by a New York Times uh, author, and the book described you know, these horrendous human rights violations by paramilitaries you know, during the Civil War in El Salvador. And I honestly had no idea that such atrocities you know, were, were so commonplace you know, throughout the world. So I started reading a little bit more about it. And I always say that it opened my eyes in a way that I could just never close them again. I don't know why, I just cannot close my eyes to that injustice. So uh, in, after college, I, I went back to Puerto Rico. I'm from Puerto Rico. I'm actually in Puerto Rico right now. And uh, in 1998, I became executive director of Amnesty International, but in, in Puerto Rico, where that's where I learned, you know, the importance of, you know, on the one hand, raising awareness uh, about human rights violations, but I also learned uh, things that really helped me in my legal career, which is uh, documenting and fact finding and the importance of that, right? In law school, you know, they often give you the facts, but, you know, trying to figure out what those facts are, are really great uh, and important skills to have as a, as a law professional. Um, I also learned of the power of what we call in the human rights world, naming and shaming, right? Which I always say, you know, a government has to be, has to have the capability of being shamed in order for that strategy to work and not all governments have the capability of being shamed. Um, but I also, you know, I, I learned the value of that, but I also saw its limitations, you know? And, and that's why I decided to go to law school. You know, I saw it as, as a means to an end, right? Um, I needed more tools in my toolbox uh, to be a, a more effective human rights defender. Um, and at that time, I went to American University in Washington, D.C., and at that time, the dean of the law school, Claudio Grossman, uh, he was also the president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is a, uh, a human rights body that's in, in Washington, D.C., that's part of the Organization of American States. Anyway, the point is that he, he asked me if I wanted to assist him in a case uh, involving the, it, it was the torture and disappearance of a Guatemalan husband of a U.S. Harvard Law graduate. Her name is Jennifer Harbury. Google her if you want to be inspired in how to do legal work, you know, for those um, who most need it. In any case, I, I accompanied the dean uh, to Costa Rica for a hearing before something called the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is uh, there in Costa Rica. And I went to the hearing and I was so moved, you know, by the case and just by the power of the court, you know, and, and it just, I felt like that, that's what I wanted to do. So much so that when I graduated from law school in Washington, DC, I got in my car and I literally drove all the way to Costa Rica, you know, hoping to get a job at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Now, uh, the court did not have a job opening at that time, but that's when you have to figure out, you know, how to make yourself heard and be indispensable to an organization. And I, I realized that the court didn't have an internship program, an official one. So I told them, I'll create one for you. And you know what? I was my own first intern. So I supervised internships, visiting professionals. Um, and, you know, eventually I got hired as a junior attorney and then as a senior attorney, um, which meant that I got to draft, you know, judgments in cases involving human rights violations throughout all of the Americas. And 
Although I found that, you know, the drafting of judgments and working in a human rights tribunal, um, very satisfying professionally. I also, I've always felt a passion for public speaking, for teaching, for being with human rights victims, for representing human rights victims, for addressing human rights violations and not just, you know, drafting judgments. So I thought about, you know, what would be the best way for me to combine all those passions? And, and I was able to do that by creating the human rights clinic here at Santa Clara Law School. And, and here at the clinic, I think my dual goals are, on the one hand, to serve my clients and that social justice uh, work that, that we do, but also mentor students, you know, to, for them to become ethical lawyers, you know, committed to social justice, as Ellen was mentioning before. And, and we define the work of the clinic very broadly, right? And I think by doing so, by defining the, the scope of our work broadly, students and I have been able to work on many cases and projects, whether it's litigation, advocacy policy issues in the US, Latin America, and abroad at the UN, at the OAS, you know, um, we've been able to cover a lot of different issues for, you know, such as um, uh, violence against women is an issue that the clinic has worked on a lot. We're actually trying to get a new treaty passed on violence against women. Issues of homelessness here in Santa Clara County as well um, with uh, Professor Sloss. Um, issues of corporate accountability, which you wouldn't associate a human rights clinic working on corporate accountability, but we're get, we've actually had five or six different projects on those issues. Uh, and uh, as, as uh, Professor Moss West was mentioning, issues of racism and police violence. In fact, I'm happy to say that two days ago, uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights granted a hearing that we requested along with the National Human Rights Program of the ACLU, the Center for Justice and Accountability, which Professor Ball knows a lot about, um, uh, the Howard University and many other partners, Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, we have a broad national coalition to address the problems that we've been you know, uh, addressing throughout the summer in, in the United States. So I'll send an email with more information about that hearing. I think it's October 7th. Um, other issues, LGBT rights, environmental issues, you know, like uh, a, a dam that inundated an indigenous uh, uh, ancestral grounds in Belize. We worked on that, on human trafficking in the Bay Area, torture by the U.S. abroad in Guantanamo, economic, social, and cultural rights, you know, indigenous rights, labor rights. So we define it broadly, right? So I'm going to close by saying it's been fascinating for me to work on so many different aspects of social justice or more, more broadly speaking human rights issues uh, every semester you know particularly when we have such great committed students so i hope all of you will reach out if you're interested in international human rights law um, as a way of advancing your own social justice goals bring them to me and we'll work something out we'll create a new project thank you, thank you so much I, I think the audience probably shares my feeling of being so inspired by hearing what all of you do and we're lucky now to have um, to let Professor Linda Starr take us home with, with um, what she does in social justice. Uh, I think you may be muted. There I am. Um, thank you for having me. And it is hard to follow that act. Everyone is so impressive and awe-inspiring. I, I love hearing what everybody's done. Uh, I'm Linda Starr. I'm the co-founder and director of the Northern California Innocence Project here at Santa Clara. Um, it is a clinic that uh, students participate in. We work to exonerate people. We work to change the, the system so that people are not wrongfully convicted. Uh, and we educate both students and the community about the issues and the problems uh, that result in wrongful convictions. I too came at this from a kind of roundabout way. And one thing I can say from having listened to everybody here is that it takes a certain amount of creativity to engage in some of the social justice work. So uh, Fran made up his path. Um, Professor Chen has figured out how to use her tech savvy to, to participate in public interest. All of, all of you have come up with some creative way to get involved in the public interest that really motivates you. And I would say that that's, that's, that's a theme and I would, I also have used that theme. I had never met a lawyer when I went to law school. Uh, I didn't know, really know what lawyers did. I thought that you went to law school so that you could learn how to organize demonstrations and change the world. Uh, I didn't know that that's not what they were gonna teach me there. 
um, I had to find that education elsewhere. I um, majored in college in entomology, which is the study of insects, and thought I was going to be a scientist. Uh, decided I didn't like being in a lab all the time and had been an activist on campus, particularly in feminism related issues, and really thought that that's what I wanted to do was was do social justice work. And so I went to law school to do social justice work. Um, I developed an appreciation for other aspects of the law while in law school, but always knew that what I wanted to do was social justice work. And so um, I ultimately ended up co-founding the Northern California Innocence Project with Professor Rodolfi. Uh, there wasn't one in Northern California. We worked with the Southern California Project to form our project. People said, there's no innocent people convicted in California. We're not Alabama. Uh, we knew that that couldn't possibly be true. And so we started the project uh, with the help of a lot of students who were also very enthusiastic about the project and the help of Professor Kreitzberg and then Dean Jerry Ullman. Um, and uh, it turned out there are in fact innocent people convicted in California. So we've grown from a very small scrappy project to a project of some national recognition. We've had 31 exonerations, one a week ago, um, and we are continuing our work. We are expanding what we do to really address some of the, uh, the issues that are now facing us with police accountability and racial justice so that our legislative reform work uh, is more focused in those areas. Um, personally, uh, like everyone said here, I really didn't have a choice. I was going to do social justice work. Nothing else really interested me. I don't care whether Pennzoil or Texaco gets the $500 million, never seemed to matter. Um, so selfishly, I do the work because I'm never bored. I'm always challenged, always challenged. There is never a case that's, oh, it's just another one of those. They're never just another one of those. I am humbled by my clients and by the witnesses and the people that we engage with. I learn so much from them, so I get far more than I'm able to contribute. Uh, and so selfishly, that's one of the reasons I do it. I feel like it is so rewarding personally to have the opportunity to do this work. Uh, which then leads me to professionally and in the bigger picture while I do it, it matters. The work that we do matters. And it's, it is exciting to get up every morning and know that whatever little bit you move a case forward, whatever little bit you investigate, the witnesses you speak with, the, the pleadings you draft, it matters. It matters to somebody's life. It matters to their um, to their livelihood. It matters, and it and it feels good to do work that really matters. Um, the NCIP always has lots going on. So for any of you who are interested in what we do, go to our website. Go to our Facebook page. We always have a forum going for going on that talk about our work. We have calls to action to support our legislation. Um, apply to be in our clinic if you're interested in participating. Um, and I'm always happy to talk with anybody about their path going forward or they're interested in criminal justice or in specifically the work of NCIP. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to take back on something that Professor Starr said, and that is that in law school, you know, we tend to think that it's all about lawyers and judges maybe. But when you start working in the clinics or you do externships during the summer or work for a nonprofit, um, you'll see that the clients are the most important part of the case and they become a, a really, really important part of your own life's journey. So, so thankful that you reminded, uh, reminded us of that, that it's not, it's the clients are, are the really meaningful part of what you do. So, um, and I think everybody alluded to that. So thank you so much. I think we may have time for a few questions and Hallie is going to, um, Hallie Bodie has graciously agreed to uh, forward the questions to us. Yes, so the first question that we have is the, for those of us who are nearing the end of our journey as law students, who still need guidance on forging our own path in public interest, can we come to the different panelists for help? What other resources can you suggest for us? 
So I'm happy to take that. Yeah, you can always come to us. And I want to make it clear that, um, and I'm sure, I think maybe some of this might have come across, but I think it was mistaken. You can do a lot of things in social justice, no matter how you want to do it. You don't have to do it the way we do it. You can work in corporate law and do social justice work. I don't want people to feel like there's some gatekeeping or some kind of purity test that goes on here. There are lots and lots and lots of people who as lawyers use their legal skills to help out other people in whatever they deem necessary. We might happen to devote most of our time to that, but you don't have to. And so this is not an all or nothing thing where it's like you're either doing one or you're doing the other. And so I just wanna make sure that we understand that there are a variety of ways of getting involved and that you should do something that speaks to you we do things that speak to us and that works for us, but our model is not one size fits all for you. So I just wanted to sort of make that clear that you should hear from all of us and you should hear from other people too and know that there are a million different ways. There's a lot of stuff that you can do in the world and there are a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, the social justice website has a few um, some stories of alumni there too. So there may be some resources that would be helpful on the Center for Social Justice website as well. And, I, and of course, you please feel free to come and talk to me at any time. Yeah, I would just underline that. I think we're, we're all very open um, to chatting with people. I'm happy to connect you to other people. Um, as was mentioned before, I mean, I might not know anything about that particular area, but I often know someone else who does or an alum or someone. And so I'm really happy to connect you to other um, to other people. Also, at this moment in time, um, you're in your third year. It's great to make those connections right now. Try not to wait until after you graduate to do that. You're going to do it then too. But right now, um, attorneys really want to, they love talking to law students. They really, really want to talk to you um, right now. They want to help you be successful in your journey. So reach out make those informational, um, well, we can't do coffees right now, but right, Zoom meetings, whatever. Although some, you can do coffee. Some will do social distance coffees with you, whatever. Um, but um, I think we're all very happy to connect you um, to people, very open. And then I've worked in legal services for um, a long time. So um, often I know people to connect you to, and they're just so, what they're wonderful people. I mean, I think they're just so, warm and um, um, inviting. And so they want to help you. Okay. I'll, I'll, if you okay if I say something else? Yes, please do. Um, I, I like to summarize what I've heard because I think it's good advice. So from David Ball, you know, he's saying social justice work is defined broadly, right? And you don't have to define, and you don't have to define your life, you know, as being a social justice warrior, right? You can just make sure that you do good within your means, right? Um, and, and, you know, Deborah was saying, of course you can reach out to all of us, um, but networking is such an important part of getting that job. Network And networking in the broadest sense of the word, your peers, your colleagues, your friends, your family members, your professors, and, even if you graduate like five years from now, 10 years from now, you can still, you know, include us in your network. Um, but also know that I know it's daunting to find uh, your path in social justice work, but know that you don't have to reinvent the wheel either, right? We have people who are trained to provide that guidance for you at the Office of Career Management. Go talk to them. You know, there are websites, you know, that we have created in uh, Santa Clara that most students just don't even know exist. Take the time to see in the social justice website and see all those links, you know, and get familiarized with the listservs and the, the community that's out there. So you have to really put some work in it, but you have a network that's going to support you doing that. And obviously talk to us at any moment. Let's see, I think anybody else want to respond to that on that point? Otherwise, I'm happy with their other questions. Okay, I said I could talk a lot. I just wanted to underline something Professor Rivera said around the network. Um, I think you'll find that your classmates can be some of the strongest um, supporters of you, um, not only right now, but when you graduate. So um, as best you can make those connections. I would say that my very first job out of law school, um, I did insurance defense litigation, but I wanted to change and do something else. And it was one of my classmates who got me that position. And then once I was there, I, 
I got another um, Santa Clara Law alum a position. Then once I worked in legal services, um, I knew someone who wanted to get into legal services and I helped them get a position. They were a Santa Clara Law alum. So anyway, sometimes your strongest network is, you know, your, the people you graduate with, the people that you're in school with right there. So make those, make those connections and reach out. And just the warning, because a lot of us have connections either professionally, and, and that includes some of our former students. But as I tell all my former students that I make phone calls for and that I help get placed in jobs and I help find direction that they're going to hear from me in a couple of years with the next student who comes along and needs mm -hmm. help. So reach out to any of us, to all of us, get ideas. But when we help you find where you're going to land, know you're going to hear from us in a couple of years. And I'm sure you'll be more than happy to help the next one who comes along. And, and that's how it works. And that's what Santa Clara is about, really, as, as well as the social justice world. Mm -hmm. We'll find you. You can run, but you can't hide. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Um, I have another question that has come okay. in. This question does look like it's a little bit more focused on um, a CG, the CGLP program. So I'm going to actually separately type up the answer to that particular question. But Professor Rivera, I was actually hoping that perhaps you might be able to share um, some more on um, some of the different opportunities that you talked about since you did mention the Costa Rica program, maybe how that brings in um, that, that social justice piece for students that are interested. Definitely, thank you. And, and Haley obviously will be the person you wanna to talk to about the programmatic aspects of, of the international summer abroad programs. Um, let's, let's hope we have them, right? First of all, you know, next year, who knows what's gonna happen, right? But if we do, I highly recommend it, you know, for mostly for two reasons. One, you know, the, the substantive knowledge that you'll learn, you know, is invaluable, definitely. But second, which I think is even more important, your personal growth by just leaving this bubble that we live in, you know, as Santa Clara, right? And just being exposed to different cultures. You know, in Costa Rica, I take people out into the rural areas, really remote, you know, to talk to field workers where it's hot, it's sweaty, you know, but you know that at the end of the day, you're going to be in a hotel and they're not. That sort of helps you open your eyes about the realities that most of the people you know, live in, right? So I highly encourage you to do some of these summer abroad programs. Of course, if you do Geneva, you won't see the rural you know, uh, pineapple worker. Uh, you'll see mostly international organizations, but that has a benefit of its own because you get to actually go to all of these different international institutions and learn about what they do, not from reading a book, but from talking you know, to, who, to graduates from Santa Clara who are working in those institutions who will tell you their path into reaching a job at the uh, International Labor Organization, for example, right? So these are also networking opportunities for you that you have professional growth, personal growth, and networking opportunities that will help you, you know, create your own path moving forward. So hopefully we do have these programs. Okay, so I can't let Professor Rivera talk about Costa Rica and Geneva without telling you about the Sydney program, where you can volunteer in refugee organizations or climate change organizations and make a huge difference there too. Or the International Criminal Court Program in The Hague, where you can be involved, both Professor Rodolfi, uh, Keith Kreitzberg and I have overseen that program where you can be involved in international criminal court proceedings. Not to detract from the Costa Rica and Geneva programs, which are <laughs> wonderful. Are there any other questions? At this time, we don't have any other questions, but I thought that perhaps to give students a chance to maybe write some more if there are additional ones. Um, I know that some of you had to rush through your comments, so if maybe there are some other comments that um, some of you wanted to share but were concerned about time. Well, I just was thinking about how um, it's really, a, I feel like so honored and privileged to get to do this work. Um, I think folks that do public interest and social justice work are just so amazing. Sometimes I like pinch myself like, is, is this really what I, I get to do um, um, for work? And, and again, it's, it might not be what you do full time, but I just think it's so totally rewarding. And at the moment, I'm kind of feeling like ugh, my social justice work work I'm putting in quotes has kind of come full circle because, you know, with all the um, injustice going on right now and the anti-racism efforts 
um, particularly in the black community, it's like I'm kind of hearing like my father's words ringing really, really loud in my in my ears. And, and at the same time, I'm like, gosh, I'm so um, glad that we I get to do this kind of uh, or engage in these efforts um, in a time that's so different than it was 25 years ago. But there's still so much more that we got to do and have to be done. So it's this really, um, I don't know, it's like a weird kind of unsettling feeling, but I'm glad that I get to be in this mm -hmm. space and have it be center of what I do. And, and we need you all to get involved. It's, um, you know, we need your energy, we need your intellect, we need your creativity. Um, as probably the oldest one on the panel, I can tell you I'm getting tired. I thought that I could kick back at this point, but obviously if you look around the world today, none of us can kick back. We, we've got to put whatever we can and recruit whoever else we can get involved. Um, to fight for a lot of basic rights that, quite honestly, I thought those fights were over. Um, and so, uh, believe me, we are, we are more than ready and prepared to step aside and let you take leadership roles, uh, more active roles. We, we want you to be involved. This, this is not an exclusive club. This is everyone and anyone can join, and please do, because um, we need your voices and we need everything else that you can bring to the table. I think, like both of my colleagues, what one thing that makes working in the area of social justice so exciting and, and uh, inspiring is working with you all, working with the students, and seeing all the wonderful things that you bring to the table. Just one thing that I would add here is, um, you know, it's fun, and I, you know, I think that. Obviously, the work is important, but you should know that as a young lawyer. Um, Oftentimes, if you are working in this area, you are working in very, very under-resourced areas. So as a young lawyer, you'll get the opportunity to do things um, that you might not if you were working in a more well-funded area. So you might be able to depose somebody. You might be able to sit second chair if there's a trial. You might be the one who goes out and, you know, um, you know who designs your strategy for a given set of litigation or whatever. So there's really good, um, there are real opportunities for expanding your um, professional skill set. Um, and, you know, I also think that, I mean, I did teach one of the international programs for a long time, but I think that there are ways in which like you can be exposed to um, communities and people, even if you are in Santa Clara County, you know, that you might not otherwise have come across and, you know, that people who had really different lives than you or really different experiences from you or areas that you didn't learn about. And so, I, you know, I would say that, that, yeah, I mean, I'm with Ellen on the fact that I'm tired, but I also think that, you know, you have to do things that are rewarding to you and that are sustainable to you. And then I know that in my own work with, you know, working on some pretty dark stuff, prisons are not super happy places, but that I have actually felt really energized and um, revitalized by, you know, um, by making real connections with people uh, who really, um, who really needed it, I think, in some ways. And so, that, so don't sleep on the fact that, like, this is actually something that, that you can feel, that will feel good to you, um, and you'll feel good about it even the next day. Uh, and I say this as somebody who always stress eats the night before and then feels bad about it the next day. So, you know, this isn't like stress eating. You actually feel good about it, you know, for a longer period of time. Though there's nothing wrong with stress eating. We're all doing it now. <laughs> so, so just to sum up uh, about the things that, that um, you as students can do, as law students here at Santa Clara, Professor Kreisberg mentioned a number of, a, a number of actions that we around the elections. But just within the Santa Clara community, you have a number of clinics to choose from, which will give you practical skills that will help you in any area of law you practice, in, in addition to practicing social justice work. You also have the summer programs where you could do internships abroad. And we have a great externship pro program that's run by Professor Pena, um, where you can extern in um, government offices or, or um, nonprofit organizations. So there is uh, there are a lot of opportunities for you to actually get your feet wet and actually work with individual clients while you're here at Santa Clara. And I, I think, unless anyone has a, something else to add, 
I think we can close now. And I, I did want to take a minute to, you, you can see the names Hallie Bodie and Carrie Bindi at the bottom of your screen, and they are the magicians who made the webinar happen. So I wanted to thank them so much. And you will see them. Hallie is the program manager for the Center for, Gen, for, Center for Global Law and Policy. Carrie Bindi is in Law Administrative Services, and they are both invaluable people to know. So just to take a moment to thank all of our panelists and thank them personally for the inspiration I felt just listening to them and to thank all of you who listened in and um, we look forward to talking with you about, about your futures and your careers. So thanks every, everyone. <laughs>